Well, good evening, everybody. Happy Reformation Day. Reformation Day. Yay! Yeah, I had to post that online on everything just because, I mean, we are Reformed Fellowship Church, so I felt the need. <laughs> well, I'd be derelict in duty if I didn't post something. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, if, for those of you who didn't know, this was the date that Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses or arguments on the door in Wittenberg, Germany. And, uh, yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's many stalwart men of the faith, um, many stalwart men of the faith that the Lord used to bring um, us out of darkness into light through the Reformation. Uh, Tyndale, Luther, um, Calvin, just to name a few. Uh, John Knox, John Hus. All these are, are are strong men of God who were willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. And because of the work that they did and, and had done, we have what we have for uh, commentary and for Bible, um, the Bible that we have today in English. So we can be grateful for all that. All right, let's pray. Father, we are never overwhelmed because you are our God and nothing overwhelms you. Help us to remember that. Help us to, when we're down, to lift our spirits by remembering the joy and the hope that we have that comes from you, from your grace alone. As I think of grace alone, it makes me think of the Reformation, and we just, I just want to thank you for the faithful men and women who you used to persevere your truth and to cleanse your church and to bring about the Reformation that has truly brought about the Western church, uh, the true church. Couldn't have happened without that. And Lord, as badly as the Reformation was needed over 500 years ago, we need a Reformation even more now. So we pray that you will graciously grant that, that you'll raise up godly men and women, that you'll raise up godly pastors, men who are faithful to your word. There's many people in this world and that that pass for saints here in this world, but their souls are destined for hell. We don't want that to be the legacy of your church. We want to stand out like a sore thumb. Having been made righteous, we are able to then do righteous deeds. And that righteousness comes from you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is not only our Redeemer, but our God too. Please be with us tonight as we study your word and help us grow in Christ-likeness. In your name we pray. Amen. All righty. Revelation 4. There's a lot to see in heaven. I'm sure even though none of us have been there yet, that we can all agree on that, that boy, if we were able to go to heaven right now, there would be a lot to see. Oh, almost too much, right? But what we're about to get into in Revelation 4 and next week in Revelation 5 is John, the Apostle John, going to heaven. And again, there's a lot to see in heaven, but in spite of everything that there is to see in heaven, he focuses on Christ and he focuses on God and his throne. And that's significant. The focus is on that. It's on the throne of God and God himself in chapter 4 and the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, in chapter 5. That is very significant. We get to see through John's vision what he saw. And so now you get to imagine what that would be like as we read along in Revelation 4, starting in verse 1. This is John speaking. He says, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here. And I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Let's just stop there, because there's a lot of imagery already presented to us. Which brings us to question one. What do the following parts of verse one mean? Where it says, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, 
And I will show you what must take place after this. What about the first part where it says, After this I looked, and behold, a, a door standing open in heaven. What does that mean? After what? After what? After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. So at the very beginning of verse 1, it says, After this. After what? That's my first question to you. After what? Verse 1, very beginning. After what? What just happened? What did you read in Revelation 3 with me? After he judged all the churches. Yeah, after who judged all the churches? Jesus. After Christ, yeah. After Jesus Christ judges the churches, after he tells uh, John to write down these letters, right? Give them to the messengers of the churches. After Christ has gone through this, and this is very important for context, right? Because we always have to kind of remember what we've just been reading as we continue to read on. So after this, after Christ is talking to his church, his church is, after that. And then after that, so we know that answer, what does John see after the letter to the churches or the letters to the churches? What is it John sees? It's right in verse 1. He sees a what? A door. A door. Yep. A door, is it open or closed? It's open. Is it open or opening? It's open. It's open. It's open. In other words, you're not seeing a door in the process of opening. John sees a door that is already open. What does that tell you? This is a door to heaven, and it's already open. What's that, what's that make you think of? What's that? Sure, absolutely. And who's the one who held the key of David and holds the key of, of life and death? It's Jesus, right? And so the door to heaven, John is hearing someone speak to him. It's after Christ's letter to the churches. He's told to come up here. And as he looks up, he sees a door open in heaven. And Christ is the one who holds the key to that door. And the door isn't just opening and it's not shut. And in the process of opening, it's already open, which tells you that Jesus Christ, the one who holds the key, has already opened the door, right? It's not waiting to be open, it's already open for those who believe, for those who conquer, for those who overcome. All the different things that Christ said to his churches and to the true believers in the last two chapters apply here. Those, those people will see and they look up to heaven an open door. Not a door that's opening, not a door that potentially will open, a door that's already been opened. That's important. It's also important, uh, well, let's see what else we got here. It's also important the next part where it says, uh, and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show what must take place after this. Who's speaking to John? Who tells him come up here? Jesus. Jesus, yep. Nobody new has been introduced. He says, the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet. So this isn't an angel. It's referencing back to Jesus Christ. And it fits in with our context, right? We know that nothing's changed. We're still in the same process. We're still talking about the church. We're still talking about Christ. He's telling John to come up here. He says, come up here. To, where is he telling John to go and why? John sees an open door. It leads to where? Heaven. Heaven. So Jesus is telling John to come up here too. Heaven? And why? What's it say at the very yeah, last? Come. Yeah, come up here so I can show you what must take place after this. Now, remember how I said that contextually it's important to note that it says at the very beginning of the first verse that it says, after this. And we said, oh, okay, we're talking about Christ. We're talking about Christ and his churches, the letters to the churches, right? And so... This is part of that. These are the things that must take place, that must take place so they won't change. These are things that are absolutely going to happen. And they take place after what happened in chapters 2 and 3. It takes place after the church. Remember that. When we think chronologically of the order of appearance of events in Revelation and Ezekiel and Daniel and other prophetic books of the Bible like Isaiah, this helps us, you know, to say, okay, it says after this, this is what must happen, must take place after this, after the church, perhaps. What about verse 2, question 2? 
What does verse 2 mean? At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, and one seated on the throne. What's happening there? He was in the Spirit. Did he die? No. Okay. Supernatural? Yeah, you could say it was like a supernatural vision, right? He's, he's transported there in spirit. Not in body, but in spirit. It's, it's a, a supernatural divine vision. This isn't just a, a short version. This would be something that's protracted. It's a longer one. What does the throne, he goes to heaven, and imagine all the things that he could see in heaven, and what catches his eye for, what does he mention first? The throne. The throne. And what does a throne signify? Kingship. Kingship. What else? Power. Power, absolutely. What's another word that starts with sov and ends in re? Yeah, sovereignty, yeah. Sovereignty, that he's sovereign, he's powerful. He's in charge, and this is the thing that, boom, that you can't, boy. He doesn't see the streets of gold. He doesn't see, hey, look, I know that guy. You know, none of that happens. Nope, it, it is the thing that consumes his, his eyes first, is the throne in heaven, and the one seated on the throne. That's the way it should be, isn't it? That's what I would expect to hear of someone who goes to heaven. That, you know, they're not, the first thing that they're going to tell me about when they come back isn't, this little detail or this little detail about the streets or I saw this, you know, floating here. No, no. Con con consummation consumed with the one on the throne, God, and his throne and what he represents. That makes sense. That would be exactly what I would expect to have happen. So then that leads us to question three. Who is the one sitting on the throne in question three? God. God, yeah. You could be right in the sense of Jesus, but... but in, in the sense of the Trinity, but, but specifically God the Father. We know this because in chapter 5, you have the Lamb of God coming into the throne room, right? And this is all to set you up in... in this is purposeful, right? Chapters 2 and chapters 3 really build up Christ as the head of the church. He's walking through the golden lampstands, which are his churches, and he is going through and judging them giving them their ups and giving them their downs, right? Calling them, uh, commending them, and others calling them to repent, right? So he's doing that in all these different circumstances. Now you go to the throne room of God the Father, and you have a focus of God the Father, supreme power, sovereignty. Just this overwhelming picture, illustration of Christ and his brilliance, and God the Father and his brilliance. This is, a lot of times people read through the book of Revelation and it's like you're, you're looking at, trying to find like a horoscope, like, oh, what's going to happen in the future? I really just want to know that. And so you miss the important framework or groundwork of the glorification of Christ and the glorification of God the Father. Again, to point that out, that's why I say that when John goes to heaven, he could have, he could have mentioned a myriad of things, but what's the thing that he focuses on the most? Oh, God, the Father, and the throne, and the Lamb of God. I mean, all the things he focuses on most are the most important things. So it's really important because that helps you to kind of set the tone in the right way so that we're reading this and looking at this the right way. What about uh, the second part of question three? So God's the one sitting on the throne. Describe the meaning of the following descriptions found in this verse. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne there was a rainbow that had an appearance of an emerald. This is somebody struggling. Do you think John was having an easy time describing what he was seeing? He's going to use terminology and illustrations that he's familiar with to do his level best to explain what it is he's seeing. He's going to, you know, God is inspiring this word, but... John has a limited vocabulary because we ourselves are limited. So, you know, John can't be using words that we don't know and understand. God knows this. So when God is trying to use John to speak to what he's seeing, he uses these kind of descriptions with jasper and carnelian, emerald, rainbows. You have Ezekiel will describe God in a very similar way in Ezekiel 1. And I'm going, to, I'm going to read this to you first, and then we'll kind of get, and there's another part in Exodus I'm going to read to you, and then we'll go through what the jasper represents, carnelian, all that. So this is Ezekiel 1, 
verses 26 through 27. And above the expanse over their heads, there was a likeness of a throne, an appearance like sapphire, and seated above the likeness of that throne was a likeness with a human appearance. And upward from what the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. And downward from what he had, the appearance of his waist, I saw, as, were, as it were, the appearance of fire, and there was brightness all around him. Hard to describe. Bright. It's like a metal. Uh, you know? Hard to describe. Listen to Exodus 24, verse 10. This is, that was Ezekiel first. Here's Moses' attempt to describe. The first one was Ezekiel 1, verses 26 through 27. This is Exodus 24, verse 10. And they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, pavement of sapphire stone like the very heaven for clearness. This is an attempt to give a description of God himself. And since it's impossible to do, they are doing both, uh, both John, Ezekiel, Moses, they're doing their best to describe God's presence as best as possible. So they're using this kind of terminology. So let's talk about what John used. He used jasper. What's jasper look like? Jasper is clear, like a diamond. It's one of those, um, when you think about white and clarity and how that will reflect every color in the spectrum, that's kind of like what Jasper does. It has a wonderful glow, a brilliance to it. It has a, a, almost like a watery brightness, as it's been described. It's like a most rare jewel. In Revelation 21, it's compared to having the glory of God. Its radiance is like a most rare jewel, like jasper, like a crystal. That's Revelation 21, verse 11. Describes jasper as being clear like a crystal, rare represents God's holiness. So when I think about looking at God's throne and I see Jasper, I'm trying to tell you that I see a clear brilliance that represents God's holiness. That's what Jasper is trying to tell us. What about carnelian? Yeah, it's also known as sardis uh, or sardius. It's, a, it, it's red. It'd be very red, like a fiery kind of red. We think of ruby red. Think of this. It's not ruby, but it's carnelian is red. Think of carnation, carnelian, red. The jasper was clear, representing God's holiness. This is fiery red. When I think of fiery red, what am I thinking of? Does fiery red make, make me think of something really quickly? Judgment. 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 What's that? Crucifixion. Crucifixion, sure. Which was meted out on Christ because of God's judgment, right? His wrath poured out on Christ. So, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's God's red, fiery wrath and justice. So we have his righteousness being displayed on his throne via jasper. We have his wrath and justice being displayed on his throne through carnelian. You're thinking, well, and notice that I'm not saying, oh, and John got to heaven and he sees God seated on a throne and it's a big plushy cushion and it's got the word written out love in big bubble letters. And it's all that it is. It's just a big sign with love on it. No, it is What's, 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 the, what's the core of God the Father? Righteousness and holiness and, and justice and, and wrath, right? It, all those things work together. You can't have one without the other. He can't be righteous and holy without making sure that he punishes sin, and you can't have one without the other. At the end, it talks about a rainbow with the appearance of emerald. That doesn't mean that the entire rainbow is green, it means that that's the predominant color when looking at the rainbow. Green is what stands out the most. It has the appearance. Otherwise, he wouldn't call it a rainbow, would he? He'd call it a circle of green. Instead, he says it's a rainbow with the appearance of emerald. If we were to translate that into modern English, we'd say it was a rainbow with the most predominant color being emerald green. 
So there's this multicolored rainbow surrounding God's throne of jasper and carnelian. I mean, my mind struggles to even paint this picture well. So you can appreciate how difficult John is like, uh, mm, carnelian, yep, yep, uh, jasper, yep, right? I mean, we can appreciate that. What does a rainbow signify? Think all the way back to the time of Noah. What does a rainbow signify? God's promise. Will God ever, God's promise to what, first off? Never flood, Never flood the world again. Yep. But if God makes a promise, will he keep it? Yeah. He's keep will he always keep it? Yes. He'll never break it. Right. So then another way of me saying what a rainbow represents is I could say that the rainbow represents God's faithfulness. Yes. <laughs> faithfulness. God is faithful. He is always faithful. So when I see a rainbow, I remember that God is faithful. Again, this is not just a half bridge of a rainbow like we're used to seeing here. Now. It's encompassing the entire throne. So it's a, God doesn't do anything halfway. This, this rainbow that encircles his entire throne that has the appearance of emerald is encircling his entire throne. And when I look at a rainbow, and I know that the rainbow means God's faithfulness, and I see that surrounding his entire throne, if it was only half a rainbow, I would think one thing. But if it's a complete one that goes around his throne completely, what's that make me think of? What's that make me think of God's faithfulness? What's that make me think of God in general? That he is halfway unfinished or he is complete? Complete. Complete. Beginning to end, yes. Absolutely. He is the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. He is everything in between as well. He is everything. You also think about the fact that this rainbow has so many different colors. All those different colors are going to represent the various aspects of God, right? There's all these different colors. And just like how God is not a one trick pony, he's got a, a varied characteristics. Same with colors of the rainbow. That said, John makes special note, and God breathes out through his Holy Spirit to John, right, to say that the predominant color here is emerald green, however, right? So out of all the colors in the rainbow, the one that's jumping out at him the most is emerald green. So when I think about green, what, what does green, what kind of feeling does green elicit from me? Does green make me feel mad, angry? Do I think wrath? When I see green, peace. Yep, that's a good one. When I, it, it's, when I look at green, when I go out in the wilderness, I've been in the city for 10 years, and I finally get out in the wilderness, I'll take a deep breath, all the greenery around me, and I am, life. what's that? Full of life. Yeah, full of life. Refreshed, refilled, at peace. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, comfort. Yeah, comforted, absolutely. All those terms work for this. And here's the, here's the cool part, okay? Everything we just said, oh, comfort, peace, um, refreshment, um, being refilled, being, um, being calmed, comforted, all those things. He's talking about the rainbow. And what does the rainbow represent again? God's what? God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness. So to believers, God's faithfulness has the effect of like what green does. It's comforting. It is refreshing. It is peaceful. It refills me, right? See, this isn't that bad. This isn't that hard. It's not so bad. You know, a lot of this, what this is, is it's, it's, it's confidence building for you because once you see how to read and exegete and hermeneutically go through the Bible in other sections of the Bible, you'll gain confidence for when you go through more difficult sections like this. And this is why God has raised up godly men who he has illuminated his word to so that you can go to Bible studies or that you can go to commentaries and, and have, your, uh, have your, uh, your knowledge increased. This is a good thing. So this is pretty neat, isn't it? Because the rainbow also was God's promise that he'll never again drown the earth, right? 
that he'll never drown the earth via a flood ever again. And that has to talk about God's wrath and about God's deliverance and his redemptive plan, right? So all those things are encompassed in that rainbow with the predominant color being emerald. Does that make You're sense? You're going to say all that stuff. You've got to leave a lot more room for us to write. <laughs> <laughs> There's the back of the pages. Come on. I don't yeah, double up. Over fast enough to catch it. <laughs> well, then you go to YouTube and you say, all right, I'm going to go true. through this again. And I'll, That's true. See, I got an answer for everything. John MacArthur says, <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> Don't even get him started on the John MacArthur thing. Because he kept telling me the other day, John MacArthur says in book 67 of the Bible. <laughs> 67. <laughs> <laughs> I always like first hesitations is my favorite. First hesitations. <laughs> my favorite. All right, let's go to verse 4 if we are pretty solid on what we've read so far. Verse 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. Which throne are we talking about? We just got done talking about the thrones that the elders are on. Are the peals of thunder and lightning coming from their thrones or a different throne? Yeah, it's coming from God's throne. Do not be confused there. So... From the throne came flashes of lightning, and from God's throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne, before God's throne, were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. Question four. Who are the 24 elders in verse four? Who are they? Who does that represent? There's lots of answers that can be given here, but I think it's pretty clear who this is. It's not Israel. It's not Israel, no. And let's just go through it. It's not Israel, and why can't it be Israel? Has Israel been redeemed yet? No. no. Exactly. Which is why we know that the 24 elders here can't possibly be, because this is concrete sequential in appearance they have not been redeemed yet at this point so this isn't represent and that's one of the common arguments that, oh this is representative of the 12 tribe of israel and the 12 uh, apostles you know there's one of each uh, representative 12 from the tribes of israel and 12 from the apostles but again i ask you what were we just talking about in revelation 2 and 3 the church, the church right so to make everything fit together well, we have to ask that contextually. Well, if I'm answering the question, who are these dudes? Who are these dudes that are here? I have no other information from what I, I'm only going through what I'm going through in, in Revelation so far. And so it would be out of place for me to think anything other than the church at this point if I'm going through Revelation in context, right? This isn't even the tribulation saints because they're not saved yet. The tribulation hasn't happened yet. So this isn't even the saints that are saved through tribulation. So this is referring to the church. And don't forget that he said this is what's going to happen after this. And so after this, after the church, after the church age, many people look at the different seven churches and say not only are these seven churches that were real in the time of John's writing, but there are seven different churches that are archetypal that we see even today. And these are also seven different church ages that you go through as well. And so you could say that this is after happening after the church age. So when we look at it all that way, it's easier to see and come to the premise that this would be representative of the church. Again, it can't be Israel. This also fits in, and so we take that with context in Revelation, but we also take this in context with other scripture, right? Does the church get clothed in white garments? Yes, right? Do they get crowns to wear? Does a, be a saved believer get a crown to wear? We just read it in Revelation 2 and 3, right? So we don't have any scripture that's telling us that we're wrong in this assumption either. Instead, it actually backs us up on it. So why are they clothed in white? If we say that these 24 elders are representative of the church of Christ, right? Then why are they clothed in white? 
Pure. Pure. And why are they pure? They're believers, yep. I'm specifically looking to say, why are they pure? And why are they redeemed? Ah, thank you. Through Jesus Christ. What's that? She said, through Christ. I was just looking for that extra at, like the comma, through Christ. So that nobody is confused in thinking that, oh, these are super Christians. Oh, these are super church-age Christians who... Oh, they did the most mightiest of works, and so therefore, you know, they were elevated to this esteemed position, right? Or lest anybody get any glory other than Christ. Because Christ is the only reason why they are clothed in white. Because he's the one who made them pure. He's the one who makes us pure. He's the one who redeems us, right? So then, if that's the answer to why they're clothed in white, what about why they have golden crowns on their heads? Why is that? Why do they have a golden crown on their head? What's that represent? Authority. Authority. Yeah, there you go there. I'm looking for something. That, like in the list of words that you could put in that, right? That's not wrong, but it's not at the top of the list. Right? If, if I am... Um, we all as believers are given a gift and given a reward. Right? And that is what? What is the gift that every single Christian believer receives? Salvation. <clears throat> Honor, glory, reward, salvation. All again, in the same way that they got the white garments, they didn't get the white garments because they were so awesome. They got the white garments because Christ is so awesome. And so they're wearing golden crowns on their head, not because they're so great, but because Christ is so great. See what I mean? So these elders represent the church, the church that's been purified, right? These believers have been purified by Christ, redeemed and made righteous, not because of their righteous works, but because of the righteous work of Christ. And that righteous work of Christ shows physically as well as spiritually in the fact that they're clothed in white garments. They're pure now, thanks to the work of Christ. And they have crowns on their head, which, yes, it does represent authority because you're going to rule with Christ. But even more so, it's the reward. That's, you got the crown of life everlasting life and you got that as well from christ we'll see that play into another question in a little bit here does all that make sense so far does 24 have a significance in other words you know it's, we talked about seven churches mm. you know earlier it could be you know there's I think that's one of the reasons why people try to find a way to to make a 12 and 12 hey there's 12 tribes of israel there's 12 apostles you know uh, you know, it's almost like you almost have to shoehorn it. You know what I mean? And so is there significance? I'm sure there is. Do I know what it is? I couldn't tell you. Nothing There's nothing. Like, I wouldn't take that significance and say it overpowers all the other stuff, which so neatly comes together when you're looking at who the 24 elders are. I'm sure that, you know, that's probably one of those things in heaven where God will be like, here's what the 24 meant. Oh. Sure. Well, we'll be known and fully known, so you'll 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 have full knowledge. Mm -hmm. I'll be out of a job. I won't have to teach anymore. So anyway, that's okay. That's okay. At that point, I won't care. <laughs> Any other questions about that part? Again, it'll play into another question coming up here. Uh, question five, what does verse five mean? From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. What does, so we know it's God's throne. We know that those things are coming from God's throne. Flashes of lightning, rumbles and peals of thunder. What does that represent? His power. Power again, sure. And it, it, not just his power, but his power in a certain context, right? If, if I'm standing before God's throne and I see peals of thunder and I see lightning shooting out of it, you know, I'm not thinking of his creative power. Uh, yeah, his righteous indignation, his righteous wrath, his righteous justice. That's what I'm thinking of when I see such a thing. And again, this is talking... You know, is this apropos? Sure, because Revelation is talking about not only the, the salvation and reward for believers and what happens for them, but also the terrifying judgment that comes upon the unbeliever. So this will, you'll see both things listed all throughout the book of Revelation. 
hope for the redeemed and terror for the unredeemed. That would be terrifying. You think of this amazing throne that we've mentioned just a little bit so far, and you imagine the all-powerful one when you see his throne and there's peals of lightning and roars of thunder coming off of it. That would be intimidating, to say the least. To say the least. What about the seven torches of fire? What were they? It says right in the verse. What do they represent? The seven torches of fire. No. Nope. Seven. So it says right in the verse. Read the verse. It's right there. There you go. Yep. It's right there, right? And we remember in the earlier parts of Revelation that there's lots of sevens, right? Seven golden lampstands. That represents the church. And then there's other things that represent the, that represent the seven um, candles or the flames that represent the Spirit of God. Seven being complete. God's complete spirit. His complete power. The fact that He is the fiery purifier of the godly and He is the fiery consumer of the ungodly in totality. The seven spirits of God which represents the Holy Spirit. So now we have a complete picture here, don't we? We've talked about the Lamb of God. We've talked about Jesus Christ, the head of the church, walking through the golden lampstands. We've talked about the one on the throne, seated on the throne, God the Father. And now we're talking about the seven spirits of God, which represents the Holy Spirit. Make sense? All right, let's continue. Question six. In the first part of verse 6, what does the sea of glass like crystal in front of God's throne represent? It's a sea of glass. When I think of glass, do I think of, um, think of the word sea. When I think of the word sea, I think of something that's deep. I think of something that's always moving, right? But this isn't like your normal sea. This is like glass, like crystal. What's that? It's like ice, sure. It's like crystal. So, you know, it's not just a thin, glassy, see-through thing. It's like crystal. And like crystal, you can have some depth to it. But think of a sea that rages, right? It's always moving. It's always turbulent. This is described as a sea of glass, which means it's going to be calm. very calm. Calm. Steady. It's also referred to as glass or crystal, which we heard from before with Jasper represents God's what? His holiness. So before God's throne is a vast sea representing his holiness, which is also vast. His purity, the calmness that comes with God, right? Because nothing can thwart his plans. Nothing can tell him no. No one can tell him no or counsel him. So there's a calmness. This is the floor of God's throne room. Everything is, packs a meaning with it. His throne packs a meaning with it. Even the ground before it packs a meaning with it. The creatures that are surrounding it pack meaning with it. All of the meaning that's packed into all this is meant to glorify God. Meant to glorify God. If, if our lives are full of, if the world is full of chaos and it's full of just all kinds of hecticness, like a sea that rages, right? But before God's throne, all is calm. It shows that God has the ability to make all things calm, right? To fix everything. He can bring everything under his control. Like the difference between a horse that doesn't have a bit in its mouth, it's running all over and jumping all over and bucking all over, and then you put a bit in its mouth and you subdue it. It's under control. God has that power. He can subdue or bring under control all things. And instead of chaos, there is order, calmness, serenity. When you think about this, it stretches out. It's not just some small little footprint. It's not an area rug. Okay, this is a ginormous, it fills, it's like a, it's like this, like a sea, right? You look at the sea, you can't see the end of it, right? Same idea. Oh, I can't see the end of it. It's the same with all of God's attributes, right? You can't see the end of it, deeper than deep, perfect, pure. The normal sea has instability in it. This is totally stable. 
So our God is not like the sea and its instability. It, he is like completely stable, like a sea of crystal glass. Pure, holy, stable, calm. It would also be deep like a sea. This isn't some small little thin glass sheet, right? It's like the sea, so you can't see the end of it when you're standing there. And you know the sea is deep, and so is this sea of crystal-like glass. It is deep. God's judgments are deep. God's wisdom is deep. His righteousness is deep. Everything deep. In the Psalms, his judgments are called a great deep, meaning that it's like unfathomable. It's hard for us to completely understand everything about God. Any questions about that? It's interesting to note that this comes in line with the talking about peals of thunder and lightning. We're talking about God's judgment, and then we're also talking about the sea of glass and crystal. You can't make glass without fire. You need fire, and you need glass. To, you need fire to make glass. So you can have something to say there about the fact that there's fire there. Fire equals wrath. God has to pour out his judgment. There's a purifying effect through fire for a believer and a damning effect through fire for the unbeliever. There's something to be said there. But if you stand upon Christ, you'd be able to stand upon that sea of glass, right? Knowing that you'll never fall through. You can be steady and calm. You're not going to sink into it like a raging sea. All because of the power of God. All those things apply here. Verse 6, And before the throne there were, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal, and all around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, with eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion. The second living creature like an ox. The third living creature with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Never ceasing to say that. Question seven. Who are the four living creatures on each side of God's throne. Cherubim. Cherubim, sure, angels, right? Cherubim. Is it the same thing? Well, cherubim is an angel, just like a seraphim is, a is an angel. There's categories of angels, right? So, like, because of the Bible, we know that there's cherubim, which we see mentioned in other sections of the scriptures, which I'll give you. We also see seraphim mentioned in one other section of scripture, which is in Isaiah. And then we'll see, like, archangels like Michael, right? And, and so we do know that there are different hierarchies or different styles of angels, with all angels being servants of God. So we know that. We know that. So these are definitely angels. Now there is a little bit of debate on whether or not they're cherubim or whether they're seraphim. The reason comes in the number of wings, right? There's a different description in that. So let me just give you some, some scripture, and then we'll kind of discuss it a little further, okay? In Ezekiel 1, cherubim are mentioned. So I'm going to read a portion of this. I don't think I'll read the whole thing, but I'm going to read a portion of it. You can read more of Ezekiel 1 if you want to see more of it. But I'll just show you that they're mentioned in Ezekiel 1. Okay, uh, Starting in verse 4. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, a great cloud with brightness around it, and fire flashing forth continually. And in the midst of the fire, and this is talking about the glory of the Lord, by the way. So in the midst of the fire, as it was like a gleaming metal. Oh, remember back to Exodus Ah, gleaming metal, okay. Uh, what else is going on here? And from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. Again, this is Ezekiel 1. This was their appearance. They had a human likeness, but each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight. The soles of their feet were like the soles of a calf's foot. And they sparked like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on the four sides, they had human hands. And the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each one of them went straight forward without turning as they went. 
As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side. The four had the face of an ox on the left side. And the four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. And their wings were spread out above. So that's one mention of, of uh, angels here. I want to give you another description. This is Isaiah uh, 6. Isaiah 6, verses 2 through 3. So we're going to have a description of angels from John in Revelation, a description of angels in Ezekiel 1, and a description of angels in Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6, verses 2 through 3 says, Above him stood the seraphim. There's the name. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of of his glory. So even though John's description and Ezekiel's description are not identical, they're obviously both describing supernatural angelic beings. Okay, so the point I really want to drive home is whether or not you get tied up on, oh, do they have four wings or six wings? Which one is it? If John sees it from this angle, he might see four wings. If he sees it from another angle, he might see six wings. So don't let the number of wings hang you up. Because whether they're seraphim or whether they're cherubim, it's, it's not irrelevant, but it's not the most important point to take from the text. Okay? And because they're not exactly identical to each other, you still know that they're identifying the same kind of, of amazing, indescribable angelic beings, divine beings. In Ezekiel 1, all four creatures are identical. In Revelation, each one has uh, seemingly its own face. Is it possible that they change in between? Who knows, right? So it's not really worth spending a huge amount of time on. But I, I, I do want to also put forth the fact that this is, again, he's struggling to say what he's seeing. Ezekiel would have had the same struggle. John has that struggle. Isaiah would have had that struggle to, to try and explain what I'm seeing here. And if you read the rest of Ezekiel 1, I mean, there's even more imagery used there. And you can have an appreciation for the struggle to try and identify these creatures. But obviously, they're angelic beings. And obviously, they are around God's throne. And if we think contextually, what are they saying about God? Holy, holy, holy. They're glorifying Him. They're worshiping Him. As does the very throne itself. As does the floor in front of the throne. As does what the throne is made out of. As, as do the elders who are in front of the throne, around the throne. Everything is worshiping and glorifying God. Any questions about that? All right, let's go to question eight. Let's explain the meaning behind each of the living creature's appearances. This is symbolic. Okay, this is symbolic language. He is uh, talking about their attributes, right? I need to describe their attributes. I'm going to use this imagery to describe their attributes. And it's amazing that the same attributes that he describes, Ezekiel used. The same attributes that he described, others have used before. So there's consistency here, which is exactly what I would expect if the Bible was breathed out by a single author who is God. I would expect that. So let's see, what about like a lion? What does that symbolize? You don't even have to know the rest of Scripture. We all know that lions symbolize power, strength, power and strength. You, and power and strength of a righteous king as well, the king of the jungle, right? So a righteous kingly kind of power. With power comes the exercising of the will and the exercising of justice too, right? Because it's those who are in power who must exercise justice. So a hatred of evil, a love of good. What about an ox? When I think of an ox, I don't necessarily... Yeah, they're strong, right? But I think of certain things. When I think of an ox, what would that be symbolic of? What would an ox be symbolic of if I'm thinking scripturally? Ox are, do ox, um, are they wild animals or are they typically tamed? 
They're strong. They're typically what though? They get used for lots of different things, right? So, service. ah, that's the word I'm looking for, service. It's a service animal, right? They, they, they do their um, duty. They have a duty. They are humble servants of God. So when I think of a lion, I think of uh, this angel that I'm seeing is full of strength and power, right? And as full of strength and power as they are, they pale in comparison to the one that they're worshiping, right? Because the greater this, the description of these angels, the greater the God that they serve is, right? If I describe these angels to you, and, and we'll get through this, when we get through this, you're like, wow, they are mighty, they are awesome. But as mighty and awesome as they are, they're worshiping one who is far mightier, who's far more awesome, right? So the, the more you build up these angels, who are you really building up? God, yeah. So a lion is symbolizing strength and power. An ox is going to symbolize uh, doing your duty for God, right? Uh, laboring for God, um, humility, a humble service to God, the face of man. What the heck could that possibly mean? We have the face of man. We know they're not man, right? They're not man. They have a face of man, so they, have some, they share something in common with man. And we know from Scripture that they don't share in salvation, right? They're not like us. They weren't made in the image of God like we were. So there's a little, there's, they're, they're different from us. Worship? worship, yeah, but I'm thinking of specifically something. We have the ability to use our minds, right? I'm not a robot, right? Angels aren't just like, right? They're not just robot, robot, serve the Lord. No, they, they have a rational mind. They have a rational mind. You and I have a rational mind. Face of a man could have that showing that they have a rational mind, that they're able to think and talk, right? Satan obviously was able to take advantage of that because he took a third of the angels from heaven and led them out of heaven, away from God. Talked him into rebelling against God. Lastly, like an eagle in flight. What could an eagle in flight symbolize? Speediness. Sure, swiftness, speediness, quick, right? When I think of an eagle going down and grabbing a fish, quick, quick, powerful, swift. What would that, like, how can I tie that in? I, I've talked about their power and their strength. I've talked about their humble service like an ox. I've talked about how they have rationale like a man. And now, in carrying out their service to God, they are swift about it. Yeah, they don't, well, I'll get to it a little later, you know. No, it's swift. Like on eagle's wings, quick. You can also, other people have, have taken this and, and also add to it that, um, like, contemplation of the truth. You know, I think, I think that's, I don't know. I don't say it's wrong, but I just, you know. When I think of an eagle, I don't think, oh, I'm contemplating truth, right? I don't think of wisdom. I don't think of contemplation of truth. But in some commentaries, you'll see that mentioned as a possible symbolic motion. I wouldn't think you'd have to contemplate very long. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the same way that they have rationale, and that's kind of the thing that also catches me, is like, well, if you have rationale, you know, in your humble service, you're either going to, you know, like you're not going to sit there and contemplate like an eagle. You know, like, I don't think of an eagle meaning contemplation. But you might see that in some of your commentaries. Majestic, right? That could be something. An eagle, when you see an eagle flying, you go, wow, wow. Right? See a turkey flying, you're like, dang. Yeah. You're like, woof. You see a penguin flying, you drank too much. <laughs> I said, and if you see a penguin flying, you drank too much. Thank you for the laugh. I appreciate that, Bob. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. you get a gold star over there. <laughs> again, so after we, after we answer question nine, we'll, we'll, we'll say again, who are these, these glorious angels, as, as powerful and mighty and glorious as they are, they yield, submit, and worship one far superior to them. So question nine, what does the four living creatures, six wings and eyes represent? 
It says, uh, the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So what do you think their wings would represent? We've kind of already touched on this with the eagle aspect. You can kind of share some of those things, but wings equal what? Swiftness, mightiness, power, yeah. If they had one wing, you'd be like, that's weird, you know. If they had two wings, you'd be like, okay, that's cool. And they have four wings, you're like, dang, he's, he must be more strong, stronger than the one with two wings, right? Oh, he's got six wings, hope. Oh. You just have to run on the ground if you have one wing going like this. There's room to circle. Yeah. It'd be like a NASCAR race. <laughs> what about eyes? Full of eyes in front and in back. Many, many eyes. Okay, so if they've got many, many eyes, what do you think that that would symbolize? They can see all. Yeah. They, can, they might not be able to see all, right? Because who's the only one in all of creation who can see everything? That's God the Father, right? Because he's omnipresent, which means he can be everywhere at once. Angels can't do that, but they, the idea that they have many eyes is to show that they have great wisdom, right? The ability to, to see clearly, uh, perhaps vigilance, that they're able to, to see, they're always looking, they're always observing, they're vigilant in that sense. So they have great perception. A lot of eyes, I got, lots of, I got great perception. Hard to trick them, hard to fool them. Now that kind of really builds these angels up, doesn't it? Wow. These are, these are powerful, potent, potent angels. And yet, they never cease day and night to worship one far above them. So, make no mistake, this isn't inserted into the scriptures to bring glory and honor to the angels. It's inserted into the scriptures to give more honor and glory to God the Father, whom they worship. And that brings us to question 10. Why do these creatures, day and night, never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come? Why? Why do they never cease? Why is it continuous day and night? If I tell you that God is holy, you go, okay. And I say, okay, no, wait. Not only is God holy, God is holy, holy, holy. And you go, whew, I get it. He's really holy. Now if I take that same thing and say, four mighty creatures of God's creation who are, are peerless among the angels worship him and constantly day and night worship him, saying, holy, 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 in an unending worship of his holiness. So if I say God's holy once, you say, yeah, he's holy. I say God's holy, 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 you go, oh yeah, he's really holy. If I say he's holy unendingly, forever and ever, day and night, without end, just how holy is God then? Well, Un you yeah, you, we can't fathom how holy God is. It goes on forever and ever without ceasing, without end. Forever and ever and ever. He is being glorified because of his holiness. He's being glorified because of his, it's, it's all that he is. It's, it's, his, it's his major attribute. They don't say God is love, 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 forever and ever, for all eternity. They don't say that. They say God is holy, holy, holy. If that is his, his major attribute that is, that is worshipped and praised for all eternity without end, should it not concern us most of all? Am I holy? No. How can I get holy? Not by my own works. There is only one way, and that's Jesus Christ, right? John 14, 6. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. No one gets to the Father except through him. No one can be made holy except through Christ. Because Christ is God himself, and he's the one who's holy, holy, holy for, without end. 
right? That's why this is, this is so significant. It's such a big deal. And it really sets the tone, doesn't it? I mean, you'll leave here tonight with a greater, I want you to be awestruck. I want you to leave here with a greater appreciation for the God who made you and who redeemed you and who is holy, holy, holy. Any thoughts on that? Otherwise, we'll go to verse 9. All right, verse 9. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Whew. What reverence. Question 11. Why do those 24 elders cast their crowns before the throne of God? Maybe we should first ask again, what do their crowns represent? Salvation. And salvation is a what for believers? A reward, a blessing, right? It can also, because it represents salvation, you can also say that it represents righteousness, right? Because your righteousness that you have was given to you by Christ, so you, it's Christ's righteousness. So you can say all that, honor, it's your honor, it's your blessing, it's your reward, it's your salvation, it's your righteousness. It's all those things. It's all those things. So knowing that that's what a crown represents, why would these 24 elders throw their crown before God on the throne? Why would they do that? Why would they cast their crowns before the throne of God? Because he's the one that saved Yeah, who's responsible for their crown? God. It makes you think immediately of Ephesians 2, right? Verses 8 and 9, that it's by the grace of God. It's a gift. Not by works, lest any man should boast. So God gets all the glory. So even though they're sitting on these thrones, surrounding the throne of God, they rightly understand that they are not responsible for the very crowns that they're wearing. They don't take glory in it. They don't take honor in it. Instead, they rightly take off their crowns and throw them before the throne of God, who is the one that deserves all the glory and honor because he's completely responsible for that reward, completely responsible for their salvation, completely responsible for their righteousness that they're clothed in. He's completely, so they're just acknowledging that. They're acknowledging that it's, it's God and everything that they have is due to him. It's all thanks to him. So that's why they do that. Oh, how powerful. How powerful. We need to do that every day of our lives, right? Just like you need to put on the full armor of God every day, every, and you need to repent every day, and you need to be thankful every day, pray every day. This is something we need to do every day, is recognize that everything I have, God, is due to you, and give my life to him. Give him my all. Put my crown before him. What about question 12? What is God being worshipped for specifically in verse 11? And why is it significant? It says, Worthy are you, O Lord our God, to receive glory, honor, and power, comma, for you created all things, and by your will they, were, they existed and were created. Why is that so important? What, what are they worshipping God for? As a creator. Yeah, why is that so important? I mean, like, what's the... If he's being worshipped as creator, everything flows from that, right? Everything. So then, that's why Genesis is so important. That's why you can't just give up on Genesis and be like, oh, it's no big deal if we... I don't want to, you know, Genesis is just a big old anchor. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to have to fight for it and fight for its inerrancy and fight for its all-sufficiency and say that it's completely true Right? I don't want to fight. I'm just going to chuck it. You can't. You can't get rid of Genesis. It's as, as vital as Revelation. Every book in the Bible is. So you see how important Genesis is when you see that this is, the, this is why they're worshiping God. They're worshiping Him as Creator. And plus, it's significant because 
He created it and he owns it all. Exactly. The creator is inherently the owner of what he has created. He also has the right to do with his creation whatever he wishes, right? We would all agree to that. And he so he also orchestrates all things absolutely. to his own glory. Absolutely. So that is the purpose of creation itself. Absolutely. Glory. Absolutely. And so all this combines to really make a, a really nice secular argument here or a point that God is holy, 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 holy. And he is the creator of all things that were created by him and for him. And so this is why we worship him and we give him all the glory recognizing that it's because of him that we have everything that we have. And he gets the crown, not us. And it's all because he is the cre he's the first and foremost, beginning and the end and everything in between. And so uh, to Jill's point, if he's the creator of all things and he, he owns us, he also, as the creator, gets to dictate what the rules are. Right? If this was, uh, we said this at the Pine Lake service, if, if he is the creator of the video game, he made the game. He, he sets the rules. You can come in and rail against him as much as you want. But unless you're the creator, you, have no ch you can't change the rules. You must play by the rules that the creator sets. And the rule that the creator set, the most important rule of all, is that you must be holy because I am holy. And none of us can be holy. So then you have a choice. You can say, forget it, I'm done. Or you can say, I'm going to try and do it my own way. Or you can say, okay, if I'm not holy and I need to be holy, what does the creator, what does the maker of the game say that I must do in order to be holy? And the answer, again, is John 14, 6, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. To do it any other way is to not play by the creator's rules. And all of us can understand that, well, you know, if I go in and start playing Monopoly with you and I bring, you know, paper money that I made myself and I've got $5,000 bills and I just bring a, a stack of them in my pocket and I slap them down and I start playing the game, you'd be like, wait a minute, you can't, you can't do that. That's, not, that's outside the rules. You can't play that way, right? And so I forfeit. I lose because I'm not playing by the rules. And so it's the same thing. You can't expect to be saved if you're not playing by God's rules. You can't expect to win the game or be made right with God if you're not doing it the way that God said you must do it. And as creator, it is his right. We could not create ourselves. You can't take the breath that you just took without God's sovereign grace. And so the, the key is to see ourselves for who we really are and see God for who he really is and the more you do that, the more you see yourself as a depraved, sin, sinful person and God as the holy, 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 holy creator of all things, the easier it is to humble yourself before him and do things his way instead of our way. What about question 13? What's something that you can praise the creator of all things for? <laughs> everything. Way to just like take the air out of that question. Just, just everything. Now, what can anybody else say now? <laughs> You're right, though. Everything. <laughs> You're right. Everything. I can't think of something, you know. I'm even thankful now for the painful things that God has brought me through. That's crazy. The world would be like, are you nuts? Are you crazy? Well, yeah, I'm a fool. I'm a fool for the Lord, you know. That's when you're, when you're living for Christ instead of for yourself or the world, the world will look at you like you're crazy. Because if you're not living their way, you are crazy. What else? What are some other things you can be thankful to the Creator for? His sovereignty. His sovereignty. Spurgeon says it's a pillow that we can rest our head upon. Absolutely. What was that, Bob? Salvation. Salvation. Absolutely. That He would save us. That He would save a wretch like me. I don't know why. You know? His sovereign, that, that is the great hope and like rest and peace that we have. His sovereignty brings rest and peace because, hey, I know that he's in control, that he's on the throne, that nothing will ever shake that, nothing will ever change that. There's never going to be a, a storming of his throne room where he gets overthrown and everything goes into chaos. No, no, instead, it's like a sea of glass and crystal in front of his throne, so calm, so so assured, so peaceful, so perfect. What are some other things, one or two more, that we can praise God for? So now you can just sit there 
and just think about everything that you everything that you've been blessed with. We said that, you know, just, yeah. just eating dinner, you know, having a head of, you know, a house over. You know, yep. Bed. Yeah, being able to taste the food. Yeah, you know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's good to get in that habit. You know, to to always be thanking God for different things. You don't have to go run through the whole list. Everything that you know, you don't have to have a twenty minute prayer of thankfulness every single time. I think it is good sometimes to, to do those longer times with God where you're praying and just thanking Him for everything you can think of, or maybe you're laying in bed and you're remembering everything that He's brought you through. You know. Walking and, I, and I'm seeing yeah. different things, and I'm thanking them for the beauty of the grass, the beauty of the trees, the beauty yeah. of the flowers. Yeah, just when I see a baby, you know, the yeah. beauty of the child. And, yeah, when God brings those things to your remembrance, it's an opportunity to worship Him and 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 thank Him. You know, when you think about the the, the vivid imagery that we described here in Revelation four, and it's just like, ooh, I would love to worship God like that. Well, we have an opportunity to worship Him every day, every time He brings something up. You think of a fond memory of a friend, or you think of the person you were before He saved you, and or like Bob said, even at a meal, or like Jill said, going for a walk, and you see, you know, God's beautiful creation, or you know, you're grateful for uh, you finally can breathe again after a cold. And, Ah, you know, thank you, Lord, that I can smell, you know, or a new mattress. Oh, thank you, Lord. Clean clothes, yeah, yeah. A brand new stapler that you didn't have to steal, yeah. Oh, that's right. We won't get into that one of these days. And I think for me, like being out of like I think that always, it's like nature for me. Oh, oh yes. Oh yes. yes. You know they oh, say yes. you know that's how that's how you know there's a God. Well, yeah. Yeah. That's that what Romans one says. Yeah. That if you look around, how do you deny it? Yeah. I mean, he, the heavens declare His glory, but right? It's, it's, the heavens it's, declare it's, Him. You know, it's like in the fall. Okay, all the leaves fall off the trees, and they're all ugly. And you think, oh, is it ever going to be spring? And then all of a sudden it's spring, and you just see these little buds, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden you see these birds coming mm-hmm. back. Yep. And, it's like, and even that, it happens every they, year. Because it happens every year, that also speaks to God's faithfulness. Sun comes up and down every day. God is faithful. The seasons come and go. Every, you know in the spring, there'll be buds on the trees. God is faithful. He, everything will happen. Really, really. That's my time. The other thing about and nature is... Bud and yeah, start absolutely. Up, and there's lots of color. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The other thing about nature is nature's big. Nature's big. You might think it's all about you, and then you go stand next to a mountain, and you feel about that big, right? So the, the enormity and the, the, and the size of God's creation also helps to bring us and put us in our proper place, right? I'm but dust. I'm but dust. And so when I think of myself compared to all of God's creation, I feel very small. And so then it makes me think of how big my God is. And then I think about, like, how could he care for me, a sinner? Like, he is everything. I am nothing. He holds up everything by his word. I can sometimes barely lift my book bag. So yet he holds up everything by his word alone. That's in the entire universe, all of creation. Oh, I mean, it really does set the tone. The idea is to always uh, have a right view of yourself and a right view of God. If you have those two things going for you, you're, you're doing well. You're doing well. All right, please join me in prayer before we close. Father, we thank you for the ability to pray to you, the awesome, holy, 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 holy God that we can pray to you, the all-powerful one, the creator of all things, that we can pray to you is an honor that is beyond our contemplation. Thank you for this, and thank you that we can pray to you and have peace about things and the people that we pray to you, knowing that you will do what you know is best, that you are so far above us and so wise and so good and so powerful that we can trust whoever and whatever we put into your mighty hands. And so therefore, we don't have to be full of anxiety and stress and fear and doubt like the rest of the world. Why should we be when we have access to you, the holy God, creator of all things? We thank you for your word tonight and ask that you help us to keep it on the forefronts of our minds. We thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night. Good night.